Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Time for some phase three. Some nitty gritty for you and me. Oh, loud and clear, okay. Time to get started. Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. Today's class is on phase three, escape conditioning. And, let's see. What we are gonna go over today, our objectives are, number one, what is phase three training? Also, how does escape conditioning differ in phase three compared to phase two? Why is it recommended to use an e-collar in phase three? Are there alternatives to using e-collars in phase three? Why widespread and variant e-collar policies are causing more distress to dogs in training than necessary? why it is important to strive for a Lima-based e-collar policy in your training plans. Also, what are the prerequisites before starting phase three escape conditioning? Why I recommend using specifically the Dogtra brand, the Dogtra brand of e-collar. And I do not, you know, I'm not sponsored by them. I don't get any kickbacks from Dogtra whatsoever. What does a command structure look like for escape conditioning with an e-collar? What does a training session look like at this stage? And when do we know we can move to the next step of training? So what is phase three training? The most concise definition that I could come up with for phase three training is phase three focuses on teaching dogs how to escape and avoid, avoid aversives that will be considered more motivational than the most stimulating of stimuli possible. So what does that mean um, in, in layman's terms? Is up to this point in phase one and phase two, right? What do we have done? Phase one is teaching the dog um, what these commands mean. What do they mean? Why is it good? Why all the good things about doing the commands? Phase two is, introdu is introducing the dog to rules of obedience, that, they, that there are consequences, that they have to do it, while also maintaining that upon a foundation that it is primarily good to do the obedience, right? So we don't graduate from each from each stage. We, we move to the next, right? So phase one is all about the reward-based training. Phase two is teaching the rules of punishment so that they understand it. And we can do quite a bit handling a dog in, fa in phase two, but phase three is for those dogs that need to be trained around very high level distractions and how we can do it in the most humane way possible. So I put a couple of quick videos over here just to give you an idea of like, what is the most stimulating of stimuli possible? So that depends on the, the dog. So I chose two clips. I choose one clip from like 15 years ago um, for a reason, because I'm gonna be doing a demonstration on this ex exact command, you know, teaching a dog to go to a place and an e-collar later on in the class. And I'm also doing something that was a little bit more recent. So one is just, this first one I'm gonna show is just this beagle. So this beagle was an in-kennel client for me, yeah, about 15 years ago, right? So it's a beagle and beagles off leash generally like to go track and hunt rabbits and things like that. And this dog was also very playful and liked to play with other dogs. So here, what we have is the beagle playing with a pit bull that I used to have play dates with and I was just having him do some obedience around it. So let's just, let's just watch this quick. Um, very old video, filmed on a potato, I believe at that time. 
Cato with the wire. Let's fast forward here to Buster the Beagle. So that's one example and also another for that particular dog that was about as stimulating as it gets but then also depends on the dog here's good or good old Orfeo from video from years ago and in this video we have Judy with him getting stalked by a trainer Danny who Orfeo loathed because we used to have Orfeo even break into her home to attack Judy and he just hated him. So here, what we're going to see is when he's in a very real aggressive state, just being able to be called, called away from him. So again, this is like very, very high stimulating situations to the dog. So here's Orfeo quick. So there's just some quick quick examples for us over there. Now it's um phase three training over here, it's on our checklist down here, this pink area over here. So we do phase three for each command only after we have completed phase one and phase two for that particular command. It does not in any way, and like I say this list could be endless. And so, so it doesn't mean someone has to completely finish a dog in all phase one and phase two exercises before they start in phase three. It just means for any particular command or behavior that you want a dog to do, ideally you wanna go through all the steps to make phase three easy with no side effects while still getting all the full benefits of what the dog learns in phase one and phase phase two. So what are the prerequisites before starting phase three? This is super important. And especially because with this course, the 5.0, I'm putting a lot of this public, right? So I don't necessarily want someone watching this video and be like, oh, and then start playing around with an, with, with an e-collar with this. You know, with, in foundation style dog training, we are built upon a foundation of ethics, which also includes sinopraxis, sinopraxis and, and lima, which is least intrusive and minimally aversive. So we're gonna go over those rules and we're just gonna do a quick, quick review or just a reference to it, but we need to understand that before we use the e-collar because we just don't want to throw it on a dog, right? We need to understand the proper time to use it. And we really need to understand everything up here before we use such an advanced tool, including having the right attitude with our dog, right? If we go into training in a dog and for whatever reason, we believe that the dog is like a jerk or something like that, we're going to behave as if the dog is a jerk, right? Our attitude leads to our behavior. So we need to understand what, why the dog is disobeying and what is going on so we have the right attitude that the dog is just being a dog. The dog is a product of its genetics and is the product of its environment and we're there to teach, teach the dog. All this stuff really needs to be in place. It is super important. And of course, the, the training, right? Um, we need our phase one and phase two training in place. So if anyone is watching this video and anything see, seems interesting to them, don't attempt this. This is designed to be part of a part of a course, right? Where you want to understand how to get the most you can out of the dog in reward-based training and then understand how to teach the dog 
punishment in as humane way as possible in phase two, the concepts. Then it very then what happens is when we're doing the e-collar, we do not have to rely on the e-collar to teach nearly as much as some people attempt when they do not use a methodical way to, to teach the dog, right? We're not teaching the dog what commands mean with the e-collar. We're not teaching the dog about rules of punishment and when, when punishment comes and how to avoid punishment. None of that stuff is taught when we get in the e-collar. We use the e-collar um, in a much simpler way, actually, if we have the prerequisites, which so, with such, so many, um, so many less, is that a word, is that a saying? <laughs> way less, way less side effects if we do it the right way. The, the other thing that we want to do is, um, is you want to understand before you use it, of course, is the equipment itself, the e-collar itself and proper fitting. I'm not going to go over that completely in this particular video because we have videos about it. One video that I have over here, it's, it's an old video, but it's, completely um there's there's nothing wrong with the video it's from like 2007 um but it's just me and earl giving an introduction how to use it watch it it's how to place it um where to place it on the dog how to use it some some precautions like one of the biggest things that i see that some trainers forget about is a properly fit e-collar it is going to work differently depending on where you put it on the neck and also you do not want to keep this on the same place for too long if you're using this tool there's something called called pressure sores so you want to ideally shift these things about every two hours to avoid pressure sores which will um, really throw back your training and look really bad because a pressure sore not from just uh an e-collar from any type of collar can look like a burn or a cut or something like that, where it's just contacts being in the same spot with too much pressure for too long. So, so as a prerequisite is understand the equipment and safety. I have a video right over here and on YouTube, it's just intro to using the e-collar and phase three dog training. It could be found. And the other prerequisite that will make this lesson much easier is this is a video from the 4.0 course and it is called phase three obedience um, mechanics chat and demo for those of you on the site you will be able to find it in uh in the coursework over here or we actually have the link right over there but you could find it find it over here and why this is important is i'm going to be going over mostly theory in this video but all the theory in the world does not help you, even if you watch me train a dog, if you're fumbling around with an e-collar and a leash and possibly possibly um, re rewards, I'm going to demo just how to do it on one command. But if you watch the mechanics videos, it will give you ideas how to hold the leash, how to use the e-collar for all the major commands. And that's why it's, why it's important, you know, how you're going to handle this when you're doing basic recalls, sits and downs, doing heel, stuff like that. So watch watch the mechanics video as a, as a prerequisite to this. Um, next, why do in these videos I am showing, and actually all my videos, I always use specifically the Dogger brand of e-collar when I'm doing phase three training. And the number one reason that I use the Dogtra brand of e-collar is because I can do, I am following a base of, of Lima by Stephen Lindsay's definition. Um, and in that, I want to use really the least amount of aversion uh, in, in training to get the same, to get the same results. And technically, if we're talking scientifically and practically, I can get, and you can get, more motivation from the aversive with less physical force. So it is safer to the dog. That's ultimately the number one reason why I use a dog tra, a dog tra collar. And you also have to know that not all e-collars are created equal. 
it's far from equal with different brands of, of e-collar. For example, with the dog tra collar compared to every other collar that I've, and we're going over a long history of here. I've been using e-collars now for, um, yeah, over two decades, well over two two decades at this point, 25 years or whatever. I've been through lots of different brands and things like that. They are not the same in the sensation that they give the dog. And if you properly use a dog trick collar the way that I show you, it is rare that you will get a reaction from the dog that would be something that you would be embarrassed about doing in a lesson or in a group class or, or something like that. Like we do not want a dog to vocalize from pain or anything like that. So for example, this dog trick collar, I put it on my neck is one thing that I like about it is you can do a stim that is super, super quick, like a split second. I'm gonna do on my neck and it is very good at just twitching the muscle, all right? A lot of people think when you do this, the dog is experiencing like some sort of like, like hot sensation or um, something like that you would imagine if you stuck your finger like in the socket to an, an electrical socket. But what you should see if I put this on my, on my neck, is is I'll turn it up is I'll start my neck I'm feeling the sensation but once it goes to more motivational levels is my neck there we go I don't know if you could see it moving <laughs> it's actually moving I don't feel anything hot or what you it's stimulating my muscle and my muscle is as much quick as I press this see my head moving it's twitching my muscle it's very weird and dogs are supposed to not like it, but I do not want a dog screaming out in pain or so worried about the aversion itself that they cannot concentrate. I definitely do not want a client feeling guilty about using one of these because they feel like they're completely um, torturing their dog. So, but there are e-collars on the market that it is very difficult to use for training without the dog crying. Some of them that are even good quality, the same, even if it has a nick correction that does it quick, technically when I test it, it gives the duration of the nick itself might be like a full second of stem versus like a split second of, of stem. So these are, these are examples. Now I, I of course always, I'm sure I have not used every type of e-collar on the market, but I'm teaching you some facts and I'm also teaching you things from my experience. In my experience, if you watch videos and I do pretty much everything unedited, what you see is, is, what, is what you get, all right? You gotta be careful with the different brands of e-collars. Some of the even more popular ones, um, when I've had clients come with those, have made the dogs vocalize when when it wouldn't have happened with uh, with a dog trick collar, all right? So there's a lot of science behind the collars themselves of how, of how they work. But that's why in these instructional videos at this time in um, September, 2021, I'm still recommending dog tra e-collars, which, which you can't go wrong of it. Now, do you need to use e-collars in phase three. Let's look at the definition, right? Because I'm getting technical. We have to be able to be nimble here. We go to my definition of phase three. It is phase three is simply on teaching a dog how to escape and avoid aversives that will be considered more motivational than the most stimulating of, stimu of stimuli possible. It is not, phase three is technically not about an e-collar. E-collar is, I will not put e-collar in my definition of what phase three is. Phase three training is just, it's the phase where you are attempting to get them to respond in these high distraction environments and off leash. Now that is important because what happens if someone is a trainer in areas where there are, where there are 
tool bands, for example, where you can't use e-collars, which is a problem, which we have to all talk, we have to talk about this all in this lecture. And um, the e-collar is not, people say, oh, you shouldn't use e-collars, you should use positive reinforcement training, all right? Now, for following along with the training, it is important to know that, yes, if you can achieve the same results of what a client is looking for with positive reinforcement training, yes, you're not gonna use an e-collar, you're not gonna use any punishment, any punishment at all. But we have to look at things that can specifically only be done with um, for that are used specifically for punishment. All right, just like a car, we cannot I use this analogy all the time. Sorry for beating it to death. You cannot replace the gas pedal with the brake or the brake for the for the gas pedal. They're used for two different purposes. So in phase three, we're specifically um, we're specifically doing training where we need the dog to understand responsibility off leash, where there's motivators that are more motivating than generally we can offer the dog at the time. And if you never find yourself in that situation where you cannot motivate where you cannot motivate the dog, yeah, you never have to use a phase three collar, right? I'm, I never push anyone to use an e-collar if there's no use for it. And a lot of pet dogs, they really do not need an e-collar for, 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 for anything. But when it comes down to it, if I show you certain examples, you know, someone has paid you thousands of dollars. And as a professional, many of my contracts, especially when it came to security dogs and personal protection, we are running into like five digits of, of payment that clients are, are giving us, you know, over 10 grand often for four contracts where they need the dog to respond in certain situations off leash, especially. And if we follow ethics, we want to be accountable, right? We want to be able to show on paper that the dog has specifically been trained to respond in those situations and it is accounted for on paper and it makes sense from a scientific per perspective. So now if before there were e-collars, if we are talking about the replacement for e-collars, the replacement for e-collars to get control of dogs, to give an aversive or apply a punishment when a dog was off a leash consisted generally of projectiles that went to the dog. And there was a whole slew of them. Some of the more popular ones that are in the older literature and some people still use them, especially places where e-collars are banned. I should have brought some in the room because I have a bunch of them, are throw chains where they would throw chains at dogs if they couldn't reach to give them an aversive. Other things, and I said it were slingshots, things slingshots loaded up with BBs to hit the dog at a distance or pebbles. And I have seen old school dog trainers that had this equipment, still did that, it still exists. Now, if we're talking from a Lima perspective, we are an e-collar is far safer than throwing things at a dog, especially things like BBs and stuff like that, the slingshot that could hit the dog in the eyes, it could hit them in the testicles, all sorts of things, all right? So, so understand um, why um, we, we, why I suggest an e-collar because it is the most Lima way to, to do things. So very, very, very important. Now, and just to kind of, this is kind of funny, maybe a little, little, little break over here is I, I tested myself, just like I put the e-collar on my neck. Like I always want to experience with the, with, with the dog, um, with the dog feels. And it's not just about the, it's not just about the equipment. It's how you use it. Right. So some of you saw this silly video where I put a prong collar on my neck and I let the dog correct me. Right. Um, a little short. Oh, 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 
So, um, when it comes to equipment and using phase three things, by using it the right way, just like a prong collar, right? See, prong collar, I don't jerk around a dog on a, even though I use prong collars, I do not jerk the dogs on the prong collar like we saw Hunky jerking me on there because I know a less aversive way to get the same results. And that is true with the, with the e-collars as well. The other thing that people use, I say it's all on the same subject and it belongs here because people are using different equipment for what we're doing inside this lesson, which is popular, is even the bonker, right? Places that e-collars are banned. Um, people use a bonker is basically just a rolled up a rolled up towel that people throw at the dogs as a form of punishment. It sounds, so a lot of places that e-collars are banned, there's no law against throwing a rolled up towel at a dog. So I always challenge everyone, like I said, is, is form your own opinion. I do, I always test equipment on myself. And sure enough, I did. I allowed myself to get whacked in the back of the head with a rolled up towel. And my opinion is it jolted my brain and gave me a headache. And to me, it was more aversive and potentially more damaging where I would not, I would not do use something like a bonker on a dog, especially if I was able to use something that I can adjust precisely to get the same results, all right? So the e-collars, the dog trick collar, most of them can be fine-tuned to about 127 different levels. So with less physical force, you find just the amount that's aversive enough to stop the behavior with the, the dog, all right? Um, and let's see, I'm gonna move on over here now. In the nitty gritty here, how do we use it? All right, how I mean, how how do we do it? So, escape conditioning at this point is we're teaching the dog, we're teaching the dog about the e collar, and what's important here that is very different about tools that we're going to use for off leash control versus things that we can do in phase two is an e collar is a non-directional aversive. So what I mean by that is if you have some sort of like training collar on the dog, this prong collar is a little too big for me, right? Is generally if you're doing the aversive, the aversive is applied a little bit differently and tends to like help move the dog in the position that you want, all right? So if someone was, doing a punishment for down with any collar. I mean, with a prong collar, they could pump it down or sit, they pump it up. If I'm getting, I mean, it helps me. It actually physically helps and directs. Now with an e-collar, an e-collar, this, this is very important, is it's the, it doesn't matter. If I'm being punished for a sit, a down, a come, a place, a leave it, anything, it's the same sensation on my neck. Did I turn this off? Um, it looks like I turned it off. Well, it's it's the same thing. It's in the same spot. It's the same sensation. It does not help me at all. And this could cause major issues in the training, horrible side effects. And it's one of the reasons why the e-collar is an advanced tool that you need, that you need to know what you're doing. Because even an, an aversive, even two things that are equally aversive, uncomfortable, it is gonna be far more stressful to the dog if they do not understand how to escape it, what to do once they get it. The stress levels will fly through the roof with the dog and you can get bad, bad, bad side effects, which is why phase, that's why escape conditioning for the e-collar is is separate and we do a little bit differently than what we do for the for the 
phase two. So the way that we do this is one is we want to make sure that we group commands into types during phase three. For example, and this is also in my mechanics video, but I just want to give a reminder because it's so important, is you don't overwhelm a dog with an e-collar. I tend to group types. I suggest it's possible you can train a dog without doing this, but it's much easier for you to to um, to read the dog and know when they understand something and move quicker, in my opinion, if you group your commands into types and don't work on more than one type at a time. For example, any command that involves having the dog generally come closer to the handler. So things like come and leash manners or this way, come this way with me, um, heal, where the dog is generally coming closer to me, when it involves proximity, moving closer to the handler, you can. I suggest you work on just that type until, and, and just use phase two training, leash training in aversives, until the dog understands the escape conditioning for those types. Or any commands that you're doing that involve moving away from the handler, like sending the dog to a car to jump into it, or to go to a place command, or or you know anything like that. Anything where you're sending the dog away from the handler, I would not mix those with command. I would not start those while the dog is still, does not understand the escape conditioning for the commands to come towards you. Again, this makes it much harder on the dog and harder on the handler to decipher when the dog understands the escape conditioning. And the other group are things that involve the dog not coming or moving away, but staying stationary and just basically changing positions. So things like sits, down, stands, um, that kind of stuff is do those separate. Technically, it does not matter which type you start with, except I find it generally easier to work with the ones that involve coming closer to the handler first, like on leash stuff and heel stuff and come, because one, it's more useful to the average client. And two, you get, um, it, it's, you get more chances to teach the dog in those in those in those commands uh, so that's that's what i suggest suggest doing it so here what we have is i'm going to go to the video of showing me and judy i'll be training darcy she'll be training orfeo and here goes some command structures so this one this full command structure we were introduced in the end of phase two so now when you're doing a training session with the dog, you keep the same command structure for any command that you are not working on the escape conditioning. You maintain it. Now, for any new command that you're doing, you switch up the command structure. For instance, in the video, we're going to be working on place specifically. And the reason why we chose place for the video is because we were going to use Orfeo and Orfeo knows a lot of e-collar e training, but we haven't done, he hasn't really had a lot of work specifically with the place while he's aroused, like with a toy or something like, something like that. So I knew we were able to, um, he wasn't going to understand it completely. And we were able to get what we needed for the footage and for Darcy, which I've done very, 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 very little e-collar besides what I've done in a couple of videos and just stopped instructional because I like to use her for instructional. She she has done some, she's done some place, but not in a couple of years. And it was only a couple of sessions. So I knew I would get what I what I needed from her here. So that's why we chose, chose the, the place. Now, when we're doing the place for those commands, it's important Big change over here is that we are not um, using the word no. We're removing the word no 
from the command structure, which is the condition punisher. And the reason why we're doing that only for these commands is because we need the dog, we're teaching the dog escape conditioning. We're teaching the dog the negative reinforcement to the e-collar and what to do. So we need the dog to make a mistake, right? We need the dog to make a mistake in order to teach them that lesson. So if you have a client or a dog and we're trying to do this and the dog does not disobey, we cannot teach him the e-collar. So if we use the word no, that's meant to allow, to replace a punishment and the dog fix itself, we also miss the learning opportunity. So when you're doing this, you have to learn to, um, to tweak, understand the importance of, com of competing motivators over here, is you have to set up a training session where you know the dog is not gonna obey. You need the dog to disobey in order to practice the e-collar. The cool thing about it is it just gives you tons and tons of versatility for doing these sessions. In these sessions that we're doing with Darcy and Orfeo, we just brought them in the yard and we took out um, we took out some some toys that we knew they would probably break for. But you can also do these like with a client. Sometimes you'll know there's situations out on walks, different environments where you know the dog is more roused by the environment and the motivators that are around them are generally more motivating than their reasons to obey that we've done in phase two, which is generally, you know, usually like food reward, petting, and mild leash corrections at this point, right? So if there's things where you think they're gonna break, you can, you have to set the environment so that the dog will disobey so you can teach. But you also have to keep in mind not to overdo it, all right? Do just enough where the dog will be able to learn, but don't set the dog up in a situation where they're so overloaded at this point where it's overly difficult for the dog, overly difficult for the handler to succeed. We are still setting the dog, always setting the dogs up for success, all right? So you just minimally create that situation so you can teach the dog. So here is a reminder to remember using the importance of pre-MAC principle, especially when you're doing higher level training sessions like this. The training session that you're gonna see over here is we're actually primarily, we always shoot with the dog, especially when they're finished, to land ourselves in the middle over here, where a dog is maintained in obedience through being kept on a variable reward schedule, a condition, a condition punishment schedule, and using pre-MAC principle, which we'll go into even deeper when we get to the generalization portion of these, of these lectures. But it's good to know where you fall. Like for instance, in this training session, we're primarily, because both of the dogs are very motivated by their toys, there's gonna be some petting and stuff we're using as a variable reward, but we're mostly in this area over here. We're gonna be using continuous punishment schedule, and pre-MAC principle, which is gonna be, their, gonna be their, their toy. And this is gonna to come together when we, when we watch it in action. Now, escape conditioning for each command is broken down into four steps. If you remember that this way, I promise it is so easy to teach the dog e-collar if you have the foundation. So, what you want to do is when we're teaching a dog, first step is you're going to do your only, there's two entries where the dog is going to get the e-collar. One is when they break a command and one is when they refuse to go, they disobey to go into the command in the first place. Let me just zip up to our, to our, um, to our command structure over here, right? So, Sometimes the one that we are gonna work on first is we say the dog's name and if the dog obeys, fine. They're in a duration. And we're only gonna use the e-collar if they break, okay? Then we're gonna use the e-collar. But if they do not obey on the first command, and this command structure doesn't really reflect it. It's a very big map if I have to make a whole new one, but it's easy to remember is when you're working on this entry at first, because it's just a short amount of time, is if they do not obey, still when you do the proper correction, 
do the leash, use phase two style to put them back in the command. And then we're only going to use the e collar when they're in the command. Relate it to this relates a lot to what we did in phase two, escape conditioning. Remember, with escape conditioning, we're making it as easy as possible for the dog to learn how to escape the e collar. So or, or, or any type of aversive. So we were in phase two and we're using a star mark or a halty collar or a precision collar. It, whatever you are using is we start the dog in the command. So it's very easy for them to find their way back to the command. So that's the way that we start off with the dog and we do that on leash. So let's see, I'm gonna go to the video and we'll see if I can um, catch this with, with Darcy, all right? Now when she does, getting ahead of myself over here is when they disobey we are only going to repeat the command in this case for darcy it's climb she just has to get on the object for darcy it is climb and we press and then we're hitting the nick button we're using the nick button in this style because it mimics a pump that she would get on the leash and if one nick works like one pump that is fine, all right? And if she obeys, which you're, you, you're generally not gonna get it on the first time, if she obeys, yes, you would go back and just praise her and go on with our, you know, and go on with our, our command structure. But most likely when we're doing escape conditioning, especially because it's just a sensation and doesn't move the dog into position, they're gonna be confused. So when you do the nick on the e-collar, if they, if they, right here, it says repeat the command with proper correction. Did the dog obey? If they did not fix himself, which is no, you have to judge, did the dog even react? Did you notice anything from the dog that it even felt the e-collar, right? That it even felt the e-collar because you're gonna start off at low levels, okay? Say so the, the use of the e-collar is, you can look, you know, look at the other videos that I did as prerequisite. You always start off on, on the lower levels. But if the dog did not even react, there's not going to be any learning that happens. So in this case, if the dog did not even react, I wrote no, raise the level, all right? How much you raise it depends a lot. It's we can put it all on a whole nother on a whole nother lecture. But generally, you're just depending on the collar and stuff like that. You're, you know, you're doing small jumps, repeating the command with just the e collar, no help, until you see the dog, you know, turn around their head, twitch their neck, you know, something, go to scratch, that you have a sign that they feel something that is at the very least annoying, that they would rather not have. And you do it, like I said, we do a nick, it's a microsecond, and they should get the sensation if it's placed the right way in their muscle, that it twitches. Now, once you get to the point where the dog, you're doing the e-collar, and they did not obey, and did the dog obey, did the dog react? The dog is reacting, even though it did not obey, then what you do is you repeat, when you repeat the command, with the e-collar, again, at the same time, you introduce the leash. Whatever escape conditioning they learned in phase two, in this case with Darcy, is I could then use the leash pump at the same time to help her obey and get her back on track. All right, so we're gonna see in the video, she goes on command, she's on the climb, she gets off, we do climb, we say, I say climb. It's just gonna be, even though I'm holding the leash, I'm not using it. It's just climb with the e-collar. She does not go back on, but I see she's reacting. I'm gonna repeat climb while I help with the leash. What we are looking for is when she breaks, we are looking for that when, when she breaks and I just say climb and just press the e-collar, without any leash help, did she obey? Yes, that she goes back on track. And if I see this consistently, then I know 
that she understand she would understand the escape conditioning at least part we're on our way to escape conditioning for the climb at least part one we got to do all four all four parts to really to really check check it off over there so let's see these are big on vid edited video and I should have put the timestamps let's see if we get that from Darcy we're in the video this one's a sloppy one I'm warning you guys <laughs> So let's see. Darcy, sit. Good girl. Darcy. Okay. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. What do you got? Good girl. What do you got? What do you got? <laughs> Darcy. Fine. Fine. Now, if you Fine. notice here, Fine. I'm just yeah. using the leash to get her on there. At this point, I'm going to use the e-collar when she breaks. She breaks, I'm just going to use the e-collar. Even though I'm holding the leash, I'm careful not to do a pump or anything that really helps her to see what's going to happen over here. Good girl. So now I have an e-collar. You have to be good enough with your leash handle and to be able to handle them all at the same good time. Girl. In that case, she broke, and as soon as I hit the e collar, she surprisingly actually jumped right back on. Watch this. Good girl. Good girl. Fine. Good girl. Now, good. I wasn't convinced that she completely understood it, especially on the first one. Um, so. We did more, and then, and then you can see that I don't think she really did get it. So watch, we're going to keep playing now, and we're going to see that okay. she does not always jump back Good on girl. with the, when she breaks the climb. I'm going to speed this up a bit because it's a long Good video. Good girl. Okay. See what happens Good here. Fine. 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 Good girl. Fine. Fine. Good girl. Okay. So I'm testing her there. You can watch is as I'm saying the word climb with her, I'm pressing the neck. And I am I have my leash in such a way that I'm ready to help if she seems confused. And I'm getting the impression from Darcy that she has enough of the idea that when she's getting the nick from the e-collar, that she is going back on on her own. So that's why I did a couple of repetitions of this. And I think at some point, let's see if we move to the next to stage two. Let's say. Good girl. Fine. Fine. Good, Good girl. So I'm definitely seeing that when I'm just doing the nick, without panic, she's going back onto the climb. Now that brings us to step two. That brings us to step two, which is doing escape conditioning on leash, enter in the command. So that's from different locations. So this isn't from this direction. You have to do both. Always start off with this because this is easiest for the dog. From the entry is you say the name of the dog, you give them the command, and if they don't obey now, no, is you start off just repeating the command with the e-collar correction. And then it's the same thing as before. If she happens to go on, we're going to praise her, and it's good. If we see that consistently, then we know the dog is understanding, at least on leash, to enter the, to, to escape the e-collar correction by going into the command. If the dog does not respond going into it, is we do the same thing. You know, if you have to, you turn up the level to see that the dog is definitely responding to it because if there is no detectable stimulus to the dog, learning can't take place. It's also possible to have stimulus that the dog detects but is so low 
it's not motivational to the dog or the dog doesn't necessarily care about it, all right? I say we could do a whole stream on the proper level, but rule of thumb is you start low and you move quickly. You jump up, you know, you jump up quickly until you see a reaction. It's not really about about the the number for every dog is individually different. Like you see we're doing this with Darcy, her levels are that we're using here are probably like a third of what we're using on on Orfeo. But we want to see it from from the entry over here. So let's go back to go back to Darcy over here, which I believe I start working on that here. If not, we'll speed it up. Darcy. Okay. Yeah. Speed it up. Yeah, yeah. You like the roll? <laughs> she's real good at top of the school. With the scuffy. Oh, it's scuffy. Oh, you think we should have a scuffy? Should I get it? That's fine. Yeah, why not? Should be, I think she'll be good. Why not? Oh, we switched up her toy. Good girl. Speeding it up. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what to do with this one. Darcy. <laughs> yeah, those are stuffy. Fine. Fine. Good girl. Keep in mind, we never, again, we're going back and revisiting the fact that it's sinopraxis. Like, e-collar, even when you're doing escape conditioning with the e-collar, which is definitely the hardest lessons you have to do as a dog trainer that is going to, you where you're going to use the most amount of versives than in any lesson, I would say, is you should still get the impression that the dog is not going to mind coming back and doing another training session with you because they primarily enjoyed the training session with you. Fine, fine. Good girl. Okay. Good girl. 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 We're giving her some wins. We're balancing it out. Good girl. 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 Darcy, fine. Fine. Good girl. Good girl. Good. So I was seeing here good reactions good to the e-collar. Good girl. What do you got? Good girl. What do you got? What do you got? Do you got? Do you got? And let's see. I think we start the I start the uh -oh. entry Darcy, on leash. Come. 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 Good girl. Not fine. using fine. the e-collar for fine. any of that stuff. Fine. Fine. Good girl. Darcy, okay. Good girl. So it's all e-collar there. Good girl. This is not e-collar. I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to do a... Uh, Okay, so here's where we start the escape conditioning from the entry into the command. Let's see how the first one goes with Darcy. Now, when you're doing escape conditioning going into the command, the same thing applies that we want to make it as easy as possible for the dog. I still keep her close to the climb. Um, if it's something like this, if we were doing the come, I would do the escape conditioning for the come on a six foot leash because the dog is super close to me, right? I'm not gonna do the first ones with the dog out on a long line across the, across the other side of the yard. You make it very, very easy for the dog. See, so I'm gonna keep the dog close, close over here. I'm gonna keep Darcy and she, let's see how she does here. <laughs> she really likes her stuffies. <laughs> Darcy, fine, 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 fine. Good girl! Good. Now what we have here is, look how close I waited to do this first one, that she was very, very close to the climb. And then afterwards, she did not obey. And every time I'm repeating the climb, I am noticing that she does not seem to be reacting that much or care or be really trying. So if you watch my finger, you could see I'm slowly turning up the level each time I repeat, I, I repeat the word climb until I see that there's some reaction from her. Then I am ready to help her. I'm ready to help her if she seems as if she truly does not like it and she needs the help. But what I liked is I saw that she was responding, she started response, she responded the right way after she started to, to care. And this was most likely because she was just more motivated, more fired up by her toy. Climb. 
right there, if you see, I don't know, it was like five climbs and be turning it up, turning it up, turning it up. We see her twitch her neck. And then this is so similar to what she was dealing with when she was just coming off of the climb. It was easy for her to figure out, oh, let me just jump back on here. All right. So let's just see that again. It's like the fifth, the fifth, so I think climb, it's like climb, one, two, climb, three, climb, four, climb, five, six. Good girl. Then she went up. Okay. Good. And that could be typical with uh, doing escape conditioning, conditioning with the dog. All right. So that's what we were looking for with Darcy. And the rest of the session is going like that. I'm just moving her further and further away. I have the whole session in the classroom here so you guys can watch it. But sessions should always end. I mean, a session like this, about 10 minutes is a long time. She gets burnt out. And we just ended it. All right. Let's say. So, and that's all that we were able to do with Darcy for that session. So that does on leash returning, um, return into the command and on leash enter in the command. The next is what you would want to do is to see if the dog can do off leash um, exit in the command. Because if you don't need to help the dog with the leash anymore, you want to proof it to see if the dog needs a leash. So when you start doing these two steps, what you need to do is you have to make sure you're in a secure enough environment where the dog basically can't get away from you. So see, we're in a fenced in yard over here. So you're not going to have a client like drop their dog's leash somewhere like in a park when they're doing this. And there's there's um, if you understand the science behind this, you can, you know, you could use a lot of common sense and versatility in in your plans. You know, do this in a small room or have a, lo a long line on the dog if you're doing it safely and just have it dropped. But I still I'm saying off leash. But what I mean is you should still just have the leash dropped. You want to be ready still at this point is if the dog gets confused, you can at least pick up the leash quick and help the dog at this point. So you're gonna, I'm gonna jump ahead over here to, to Orfeo. And if anyone has any questions along the way over here, cause this is a lot of information, put them in the pack howl and I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll go. So we have like the beast over here and we used him, we brought his placemat out here because this isn't an exercise you've really done with him. Most of um, Orfeo's off leash work has actually been doing recalls and heal and sits and downs. And he does know, he does know an e-collar place, but it's just been kind of like around the house and we've never done it off of him like intensely um, biting something. So we thought we could probably get some footage of what off leash exit in the command and off leash enter in the, the, the command was. Let's see what we got here with, uh, with Orfeo. <laughs> Um, so we did first do on leash and off leash, which you'll see. And we did him further away. He was too slick. He actually, <laughs> he actually listened to that. So that's if they don't mess up, if they don't mess up. You can't teach them. So what we did here is I held the tug so far away that he couldn't carry it back to the place. So then. Again, you tweak your competing motivators and you try to find a situation where you think the dog is not going to obey. So what we did after this is I held on the next ones, I held the tug further out so he couldn't drag it back with him. So now he has to decide to obey um, or keep holding on to the to the tug. So we were able to get uh, an e-collar correction and you should see what it should look like, you know, as the dog, let's see what happens here. Orfeo, place, 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 place. Good. Good boy. So this is what you're looking for on the leash. We sort of ended that way with Darcy and it, we're kind of at a starting point with that with, with Orfeo. And then we get, where do we start where she drops the leash? Towards the end here. So we don't have to watch a whole 18 minute video, but somewhere around here, yeah, we're, we're dropping the leash. And you want to do dropped leash where you 
get them where you do an e-collar when they break, because that's real easy, all right, when you start dropping the leash. Very easy with clients if you have them just do it like in their living room. They're on the placemat, they're using the e-collar, they practiced some with the, with the leash, and now what they do is the dog has the leash on, they're on a placemat, they're a few feet away, as soon as the dog breaks, the moment they break, they can do place or climb, whatever you're doing, and right away they do the e-collar as soon as the dog is getting off, and they can see if they did their work on the leash, most likely it's going to be smooth, the dog goes back on, but if the dog needs help, they have a leash, they can help the dog out there um, very, very, very quickly. Another recommendation that I tell you is I'm showing these one after the other. With my clients, and what I suggest you do with your clients, is 90% of the time, I had them only work on the step. This is a great trick. Is only work on the step, on leash, coming out of commands for a full week before I saw them next for that particular command. So for instance, if you were working on an e-collar with the sit or an e-collar e sits and downs, I tell them, use your leash to put them in the sits and downs if they disobey. Use only the e-collar when they break command and it's so easy, they're there to help them or only when they break the climb or only when they break out of the heel on the leash or only when they break the come when they're on the leash, meaning they told them to come, they're on the leash, they step away before they're freed, they say come. And what happens is just by the end of a week, the owner and the dog, they know it so well that the dog easily does it from out of position at that point. And then you make it like a two-part two training session. Remembering that when you're using a checklist system, it's not like you're wasting a whole lesson just doing a piece of a one little piece of a mini lesson. They're generally working on phase two and work on other things in a checklist, right? You just say, just you start an e-collar, make it easy for them, set them up for success. Just do, just do, just do one part of it. But then what you're basically looking for is, let's see, towards the end of the session, Good boy. is we have the leash dropped. We need him to disobey, and we need to make sure that he knows how to get back to the command with just, with just an e-collar correction. He knows how to escape it. We'll make it easier for him. We'll be right here. Oh, good boy, yeah. Or fail. Place. 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 <laughs> good boy. Good. 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 So we're looking for that, and then we got him doing it on one on one nick here. He's trying to make it easier for himself. <laughs> we got it on one nick. Let's we'll speed it, it up. There was one freebie. One freebie. On, yeah. Work that out. Place. Place. Good. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. <laughs> Work that out. Okay. Good, Good job. Good. I don't get one long one of me and I'll give it to him. Okay, that was one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're so smart. You're so what smart. a good boy. So we ended off with fun and just play with them and Judy prances around with them and you know at the end then it's just we ended off in a in, in a good way all right so recaps of that training session there because this this is a lot you may have to go and like rewatch this video a couple times because this is you know these are complicated complicated subjects is you're breaking this down all right now remember the dog is supposed to disobey and this is why I say understand how to tweak your competing motivators. Your job is to, one of the arts of dog training is you gotta create the scenario where you need the dog to disobey and you need just that right level where it's uncomfortable. Notice we're not doing these high levels. You're doing an escape condition, the lowest level that annoys the dog that you think they're gonna challenge it but at the same time, once it happens, like, all right, this kind of sucks. Let me try to get rid of it. All right. Um, 
If you jump up, and this is important, I don't let's have this in the notes. If you use too high of a level when you're doing the escape conditioning lesson, you can slow down your training because the dog will not want to participate in the training. They will decide, I'm not sure what happened, how to avoid that, how to escape it. I know this just occurred during a training session. And if I just don't take part in the training session, hopefully that won't happen again. All right. So you do not do those higher levels. And that's another reason why we break in things down in into smaller steps, all right, and why there's an avoidance conditioning. This escape conditioning is so important because in the next step, in the next lecture, I will show you how to train the dog to avoid the e-collar altogether. All you know, to avoid it, to avoid it altogether. So that in similar situations, in repeat situations, that it's very unlikely they're ever going to have to get an e-collar correction. And then that sets us up for generalization where we get them to never have to get an e-collar correction in more and more environments. All right. But this escape conditioning is, is key, is key right here. And you have to do it for each, you need to do it for, for, each separate command, all right? For each separate command, like that was just for, for Darcy, we were doing a climb, which was technically, she just had to stand on it or do whatever she want. Or Faya, we were doing a place where he had to be on it and, and lay down. But a command can mean whatever you want it to be in any language, any command. But that's an example of what a training session would, would look like. Now, we're gonna move on. So things we have to we have to cover over here from our professional perspectives. All right. So when do we know we can move to the next step? Just to reiterate, the step one is when the dog responds to a nick, a single nick by returning to the command without the leash help. All right. It doesn't mean the very first time you see them do it, you just move on to the on leash enter in the command. You just want to, it may take two or three at least, be sure it wasn't a fluke, then you can move on to on leash enter in the command, all right? So when they're, when they're on the leash and they're not on the command and they disobey, you want to see too that they disobey, you need them to disobey, then you need to see on one nick, ideally, they then return to the, to, they, no, they, they don't return to the command, they obey the command, all right? Off leash, the same thing except, as we have over here, except we don't have the leash. We wanna make sure that leash is not being an extra prompt to the dog, that the dog understands it, and off leash, enter in the command, the same thing. Once you see the dog can do it um, off leash, then you can you can check it off, and then you can move to the avoidance avoidance conditioning. Next subject. Uh, important is our professionals. Is the way that we're teaching it says why why is foundation style dog training Lima? All right, we have Lima as a prerequisite a prerequisite lecture to this lesson. Lima, of course, is least intrusive, minimally inversive in dog training. And I have a link over here to that lecture, but I did put a couple of quotes here from Stephen Lindsay, right? So Stephen Lindsay is the one who coined Lima and by far has the, the best you know the, the 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 best done volumes on on dog training from a scientific perspective there is and lima is the one thing that most organizations seem to agree upon that dog trainers should adhere to although many may twist the definition of it that's not our fault as a professional right our professional is to know what the real definition is and and adhere to it so E-collars can be used least intrusively and minimally aversive. 
And to quote Stephen Lindsay's view on e-collars is he calls them a device for delivering remote punishment that has considerable usefulness in the remote activated is the remote activated electronic collar. Remote electronic stimulation provides a means for delivering a well-timed and measured aversive event. In many ways, it represents an ideal positive punisher, having many potential applications in dog training. So remember, when you hear someone quoting Lima and saying, Lima, if you are practicing the guidelines of Lima, you don't use prong collars, you don't use e-collars, they have not studied Lima, all right? They're just usually repeating repeating rhetoric or unfortunately are have been duped by someone that they trusted, an organization that they trusted, and knowing what the wrong the wrong definition of it is. Like I said, a good e-collar is less aversive than other tools used for the same purpose. Remember, because you can adjust them. You can only throw something at a dog only so hard. It's it's very hard to adjust other off off leash types of aversives. And the timing, I say you cannot beat the timing of the e-collar and you cannot beat the amount that you can adjust it, right? And the proof is in the pudding. I'm showing you a Portuguese water dog, German shepherd, two, you know, two totally completely different types of dogs, and it allows me to be transparent. It allows you to be transparent, not be embarrassed about something. I'm not embarrassed about putting any of those training sessions up. I never had to, I was always able to do large group classes and big facilities with people walking in and out. Never had to be embarrassed of anything that I had to do. Never had to edit any videos to show um, something scary that was going on with the e-color. But this is important too, which we're gonna talk about which is a problem in our industry. And I believe one of our responsibilities in being a, a good representative of, of professional dog training is Stephen Lindsay says, what may not be justifiable is their current widespread use by dog owners with little behavioral background or experience. There is considerable risk for abuse when such collars are placed in naive and experienced hands. Now, he wrote this. This volume was written quite some time ago, too. I, I, I forgot the year off the top of my head. But I believe this was easily that he wrote this at least. I think this was written at least like 15 years ago. And the consequences are showing are showing now. Um, and I put some put some notes over here is is um, why what we're doing is Lima and why we're having consequences if trainers um, stop stop being Lima or try not to to follow the guidelines of Lima when you're using the dog when you're when they're using e-collars. So for an example, um, if you use the e-collar this way, we are potentially for trying to be least aversive or minimally aversive, we are using, easily potentially using over 99% less e-collar stimulation used during the actual process. To give you an example, I'm going to jump around a bit over here, all right? The most popular dog training franchises in the country, probably in the world, are based off of um, e-collars. And people buying into a franchise and getting exactly three weeks of instruction of how to be a dog trainer, which includes how to run the business. And most of it is based off of putting an e-collar on the dog, usually on day one, often on day one. And they're teaching the dogs with the e-collars. And a lot of the process, the commands are learned using the e-collars. The rules of punishments are used during the e-collars. Everything we see up in that checklist is being done with e-collars. And they're generally using continuous stimulation, which right away in one training session is we're using, even if you tap, tap a continuous stimulation, um, the, a continuous stimula stimulation button, it's giving you on average, at least with the dog trick collar, about four times the duration of stimulation. So, so, so if you're trained, if we're using a method based off of adherent to Lima, like we see with foundation style dog training, is you're not using nearly as much to, tease, to teach the commands. Um, also, it is 
If you're using best practices of escape conditioning, you're making it easier and quicker for the dog to find the answer of how to escape it. Again, you're reducing the amount of aversives to the greatest amount possible. If you primarily use the nick, except for there, there are times in training where you may, which isn't part of this lecture, but primarily based training, you're going to be 99.9% 999% of the time just need to use the, the nick. Is we're using far less of versus by just using a nick versus holding down continuous buttons. Also, if we're using a foundation style method, they have already learned how to avoid punishment before using the e-collar. So even understanding how to avoid e-collar, when we're doing the avoidance conditioning part of phase three, it's very short because they already understand when punishment comes and how to avoid it. So you'll see when we're using the e-collar in the next phase, once they decide that they don't like the e-collar, they know how to avoid it. They just, they just avoid it, all right? It happens very, very quickly. Again, reducing the amount of aversion, reducing the amount of stress. Also, there becomes, because you are using other methods to get the same behavior, which adheres to Lima, Less of, if you can get the same behavior through positive reinforcement training um, by using pre-MAC principle and stuff like that, you are also using the e-collar far less on a Finnish dog. Also, um, on the Finnish dog, when you do use the e-collar, you're also generally going to see, you're going to see you're using lower levels of stem even on the Finnish dog. The reason why, and this is proven in research, and I'm going to put up the studies. I think i got to put them up. Is right here, what it says here. It is proven that the more, expo the more that you do stim a dog with an e-collar, the more they build up a tolerance to it. So then ultimately you have to use higher levels to get the same effects. So when people are doing a lot of teaching with the e-collars, even people that have really, really good intentions, all right? And they're using low levels and they're being quite humane about it. Like I've definitely know of trainers, there's more than one way to skin a, skin a cat. There's definitely lots of different ways to train, to train a dog. But, and some trainers, their heart's in the right place. They use e-collars much earlier, do not do a phase one, phase two. And they're using lower levels, um, introducing escape, escape conditioning training early, early in the training. But ultimately, the dogs get more and more time to, th to, to, uh, to be desensitized to it. And remember, it's supposed to be used. Ultimately, the end result that most people use an e-collar for and what it is best used for and what it does not have a good replacement for as a device to be used as punishment for off-leash training and very high level distractions or competing motivators. So um, the more in a training plan says using lower levels, you will see they generally need higher levels later on in the training and in maintenance, all right? So if you do it this way and they're being exposed to less, they do not get desensitized as easily and you're using lower levels with the finished dog. Um, also, again, this is sort of a, um, I sort of mentioned this, by adhering to phase one, phase two, phase three, understanding the dog, understand how to manage the dogs. Again, we're doing least, we're still adhering to the rules. If something could be accomplished by, um, in, in other means by mastering your reward schedules, mastering your conditioned punishers where you're just using the nose, mastery of pre-MAC principle, you're using le less aversives, all right? Now, current problem from low standards of use. And this doesn't really single any company or any trainer out because it is so varied out there right now when Lima is not adhered to. And I'll give you some examples. The most numerous dog training franchises in the country, the most successful ones only require three weeks of school that revolve around the use of e-collars. So there's hundreds and hun there's, there's hundreds of um, franchises out there, locations that they're only requiring three weeks of instruction, which is they generally have less 
knowledge professionals of how to train a dog and dog behavior than many dog trainers clients have after you know get more training from a professional training that went through a more a more formal course also pet owners can attend seminars and are handed to e-collars without any prerequisite knowledge now again this varies a lot there varies People can go to seminars and it can range anywhere from a trainer that just hands people e-collars and just starts starts frying the dog within minutes um, to someone who does a seminar and very thoughtfully, very thoughtfully and as humanely as possible tries to teach someone to use to use to use the e-collar. The problem with this is when we're not adhering to a standard, is even the best of the seminar trainers is there's no guarantee. There's a lot of things before using the e-collar that there's no guarantee that these people understand, all right? there's So we're not being Lima, right? A lot of problems could be solved without the e-collar. So there are a lot of like seminars and things like that. Like I say, it really, really, really varies is we don't know what's happening in these. And there's no standard. No one's really holding the standard. Even, which I love the device, I love the tool, even the Dogtra brand, which I love this brand, a consumer can buy this, and I, I counted the amount of sentences. The, they give you instruction on how to use it. I think, I think I counted 16 sentences of instruction on how to train a dog, with an with an e-collar so overall and like i said even these franchises because you know people are going to watch this that don't want a franchise it's i'm talking minimum you know, i'm talking minimal standards of what could possibly occur i know i have seen some some trainers who have bought into franchises that came with their own bunch of knowledge and continue to learn even after they've been in the fr in the franchise and know more than minimally or what they're supposed to know. But I'm just showing you that there's there's just no standards. Like this is really the bare minimum. Now, this is definitely a consequence of this. There's bad public relations, all right? There's tool bans. Consumers are not protected. Consumers are not protected. If um, someone calls, uh, you know, they they call the, you know, they go in the, uh, inter I was gonna say the phone book. No one uses the phone book anymore. Um, but someone goes online, they find a trainer, and they're going to drop their dog off for a two-week board train program or whatever, is the dogs, they don't really know what's going to happen to their dogs with the e-collar. So we're talking about uh, protecting the dogs also, and we're also about profession, professional protection. Um, if someone I noticed for the first time, I would say about 15 years ago, was around the first time it was when e-collars started the first spark i would say you know about a, somewhere between like a decade and 15 years ago when these first sort of like quick i always knew the e-collars can be abused or or what's the word be used like for hack training for like quick fix it's and stuff like that from a business perspective I remember getting phone calls for the first time about a decade ago, a little bit more than a decade ago, where people would call up for dog training and asking if I used the e-collar for off-leash and ask how quickly that I could do it. And they're like, oh, well, this other business said they could do it in two weeks, right? And I was not going to try to compete with that. I was I was fine. It was like, well, you're gonna kind of get get what you pay for, trying to be try, trying to be nice about it, all right? Is what are the standards? that a consumer should expect when they're training the dog and what are they missing? And again, I have lots of stories about what happens when a dog gets an incomplete education and when you hand that dog over to a hand to a person who has an incomplete um, education. Now, I, I'm not out to bash anybody because the reason why is owners don't know any better. Lawmakers don't know any better. Matter of fact, even many professionals do not know any better because they 
the cliche saying they don't know what they don't know, even if they have good intentions. A lot of people spend a lot of money to enter franchises, go to seminars, go to schools, and they trust that they are being taught in a way that is going to work really good for their business and, and is going to work long term and stuff like that. But because there are no real standards, these consequences are happened directly because of it, where it isn't very unlikely this would happen if there was much more of a standard when we are using e-collars. And I put over here, I'm not even going to, um, you know, I put additional info over here. I'm not even going to put it on this, on this stream. This was an old blog post and it shows footage that was in the news um, from from a franchise and you can see the difference See, the proof is in the pudding where someone was hiding, watching a normal days of work behind and it looks horrible. You know, the stress levels of the dogs and stuff like that, where but the, the potential errors that could happen on the far end of what is considered acceptable in the business. And I put this link here, especially because they were tried for animal abuse and they got off, right? They were not, they were not proven to be abusing the dogs because it was considered within the status quo. So, you know, there's this one. I'm not going to play any play any of the videos, but it's you know, it was franchises. There was lot. Someone put out lots and lots and lots of video. No need to play it. Definitely, there's names of trainers and stuff like that. But it's not about the trainer. It's not even the trainer's fault that was on trial. Right? He was just doing what he was taught. And they and they and he doesn't even doesn't even doesn't even know any better. So let's see what's Art saying here. Suggested regarding the vids. How about having a light word flash each time you're stimming because it's hard to see exactly when you're stimming. I'm pretty sure that's technically possible. Oh yeah, yeah, Art. Um, yeah, for instructional videos that would be really good. But one man team. I don't have quite an editor. But what I can say is um, if you. If you understand, if you study the command structure, I am adhering to the command structure. So, so even though that would be ideal for maybe someone who was kind of curious, if someone is watching, I say these videos, like I, I would still do it if it was easy for me to do it. Um, but, and that would be ideal for someone who was curious, but I am mostly right here. I, I, what I'm mostly doing in these videos is I'm catering to so, to the professional dog trainers who have learned everything up to this point and are looking at the command structure and they should be able, and I, I have the remote collar on the same side as the camera and you should be able to see the dog's reaction and you should be able to study the, the command structure and, um, and it should make sense if you, if you actually study that. All right. But yes, it, a lot of people do like sound effects and stuff like that. And I actually would do it. I would do it if I had, if I was set up for it, but it's not, you'll see, it's not really necessary. If you, if I would actually prefer someone study, study the command structure, watch the dog carefully for the reactions and know when the stim is actually happening. Um, but, um, I am, uh, I am, the videos are very, very, are very technical to the command structure. So if you know the command structure, you should, you'll know when the stim is happening. And there are also times, especially if you watch this full video over here, when you're watching it, there are times where I pause, there are times I use the word nose. Anytime where I have a brain fart, I basically pause and just regroup. And that's obvious. That's obvious too. So I hope I that, answered that, that question there. And remember, when you are observing a client, you're also not going to have any sound effects or flashes when they're using the e-collar too. So you got to be good at observing and, you know, and, and watch, watching them, watching their command structure, watching their hand, watching the reaction of the, the dog. Last thing that I have here is just in summary, learn this way and you can be transparent. <laughs> you can adhere to Lima you will get better long-term results. You will enjoy the training more, which is why, why we're doing it. We could be Sinopraxis. Um, you can handle high difficulty cases. These, if you watch my videos, right? Like I, matter of fact, that's why I 
I'm t that's why I actually showed. I always try to like, it's very easy for these classes to go on for a really long time. One of the reasons why I put this, this video, is this one of my first, my own pers, one of my first personal YouTube videos I put up, which was like in 2007 after I was training for about a decade. And, um, the th and the thing that set it apart, why people were willing to pay more money and get higher, I was getting um, um, higher value training contracts and stuff, is because when you can control the dog around higher level distractions and things like that, you can, people will pay more money, right? It's not, it's something, it's higher level instruction. People don't know how to necessarily do it themselves. Anyone, go back to Bob Bailey, is... Is any person, he said any person could train any animal to do almost any behavior if you give them enough time. So anybody could grab, could buy a dog trick collar and read the manual and get their dog to go to a place command. Um, but what is that process going to look like? How is enjoyable is the process is going to be? How often are they going to have to be holding a controller in their hand? Um, in order to get the dog to always to always do it, you know, it's that's why that's why they pay a professional. That's why as a professional, you learn all the steps, you learn how to do it. You can do, like I say, you can do high difficulty cases that require a lot of responsibility, a lot of liability, especially when it comes to things like um, aggression cases, dogs that people need to manage the aggression or dogs that people are trusting you to control aggression in work environments. So it allowed me to be able to work with security companies and police and personal protection. And it allowed me to have a very fulfilling career um, working with high level cases. So, but escape conditioning is, escape conditioning, phase three escape conditioning is, the most difficult phase where you have to use the most judgment calls where people should spend besides command structure is people should spend the most time studying it. And you never, ever, ever allow a client to work in phase three or escape conditioning if they are not solid with their phase two especially knowing that command structure like the back of their hand because all phase, mo vast majority of phase three problems that you will find are phase two problems. If someone is trying to use an e-collar yet using wrong command structure, using wrong rules, not using the dog's name, properly, you know, not using the right timing, all those kind of things. Um, two, come back to the beginning over here, our objectives, make sure that we have covered all of our, object our objectives. What is phase three training? All right, right there. It is specifically teaching the dog to escape, avoid aversives. So that will be considered more motivational than the most stimulating of stimuli possible. This is this is very nitty gritty, very, very, very nitty gritty stuff that should be taken, taken seriously. How does escape conditioning differ in phase three? It differs in phase three, mostly because besides the fact that we're using aversives that are um, more motivational and have more potential for abuse, there's generally, since we're using it for off-leash stuff, we're using non, non-directional um, aversives, which it's very important. So you have to make sure that the dog understands what to do. You got to be ready to ready to help. That's a major differences. Are there alternatives to using e-collars in phase three? Yes, they've existed. All right. It's usually things that were projectiles that were that were that were thrown at dogs. And technically, too, if someone they can use a more motivational leash correction if like e-collars and stuff like that are banned but it is not it is not the best all right it is not the best thing to do because it's technically if we're not if a trainer is not held back by laws 
that were put in place because of misuse and misinformation in the first place, what happens is, is when tools are misused and then they're banned, it actually causes dogs to now have even more aversive things done to them if a trainer does not have um, does not have proper does not have ability to use those tools. All right, like dogs, as long as there's ignorance, dogs are always on low standards. Dogs are always going to be abused. They're always going to be um, getting more aversives, more stress than than necessary. All right, but even using saying leash corrections and 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 light lines, you know, we we could use light lines and pick it up to, to start getting the dogs off leash and doing higher level pops, now we're getting to something that is much more physical and also makes the handler just by default seem more aggressive to the dog. Because now the dog has to see a handler using more muscle and be more aggressive, which e-collar allows you to stay calm and just adjust the level, keep your happy voice. And to the dog, it is just, it is just a sensation on their neck that's more aversive. All right. So... Very, very important. Um, why is it important to strive for Lima-based e-collar policy in our training plans? It's to protect everything. It's to protect our profession. It is to allow for, if e-collars e used properly are definitely the most humane way to do high-level off-leash training. If there is a different way, I always invite people to show me, and I would, of course, add it into the instruction, all right? Um, what are the prerequisites before phase three escape conditioning? Understand the safety of using the tool, understand the mechanics, understand your foundation before it, all right? Dog to brand e-collar, right? I think I beat that one to death. And why does the, the command structure is down there? We have it. What does a training session look like? We just saw it. And when do we know we can move to the next step in training, all right? That dog receives that the dog needs to disobey you need to see them respond properly with help to the e-collar correct to the to the e-collar correction because at that point now it's it's actually a correction they feel it and they know they fix themselves um due to it by by escaping it then it allows us to move to the to the next step okay so I will end this one for now. Thank you for everyone's patience moving through this one. It's a, it's an important it's an important stream. And I will be back for Q&A, question and answers in the classroom on Wednesday.